Hey, this is Snowblitz. Six strain. Starlight Ironhoof. Four strain. And Zeta Prime. And this is Elements of Harmony. Tonight on the show, we feature a brony who is not afraid to produce in many genres, from drum and bass to orchestral to post-rock to a bubbly French house discotheque dance track featuring Fenning chanting, please don't jump. Seventh Element is not afraid to bend the rules or explore new and interesting musical endeavors. He recently released a hauntingly dark Fallout Equestria concept album entitled The Ministry Mares and has been making his rounds on the convention circuit this summer. Seventh Element joins us here tonight. Seventh Element, hello. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm super. How are you? I am still breathing, so I think we're good. That's good. Fantastic. That's great. <laughs> also 68. Still breathing and slightly muffled. Yeah. Did anything happen recently that would make you stop breathing? Nope, don't think so. Okay. We have Seventh Element, who I believe is the element of 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 sevens yes pizza 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 i was gonna say music but sure pizza the element of pizza i love pizza <laughs> with anchovies right okay seventh i'm calling you princess pizza from now on <laughs> yeah so for a while there my oc was just an alicorn toaster so huh. you know pizza or toast whichever wow oh, i remember that now <laughs> that that wait that was you yep that's me the alicorn toaster wow that that makes sense now. We need more brilliance like this. Indeed. Tell us about your brilliance, Seventh. Uh, for those that don't know you, who are you and what do you do? I make music about little pretty cartoon horsies. Sometimes it's sad and sometimes it's not sad. It's kind of how it works. Do you have a favorite technical or horse? I don't have a favorite. I like the main six ones for different reasons. Wait, hold on. There can be no dispute about this. Pick best horse. I will not pick best horse. Then get out. What about best race? Like Pegasus, Earth Pony, or Unicorn? Very well. <laughs> Zebra? Unicorn. Zeta, get shut down. Unicorn elitist. Uh, interesting. All right, that narrows it down to Rarity or Twilight. We all know it's going to be Twilight. Anyway, continue. Yeah, you're right. Continue telling us about yourself. I've been making music since about 2008. That's when I started messing around with FL Studio and all that stuff. Yay. I'm no professional by any means. I, I've taken piano lessons since I was six. Well, I stopped at some point, but I just kind of mess around. Music is kind of uh, something I do in my spare time. It's uh, just a hobby, more or less. And then this happened, and the cartoon horses got into it. And then, yeah. Now I'm here. How'd you originally first get started into the music making? Before or after Cartoon Horses happened? Before Cartoon Horses. Well, I used to make really awful RPG Maker games. And I was like, I should make soundtracks for these. So my dad, being the wonderful technical genius he is, got out our four track and taught me how to use that. With a drum machine and a crappy keyboard. Wow. And it sounded terrible. That is the way you learn music right there. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yep. It really is. That's awesome. I had to record on a cassette tape and put the cassette tape into a thing that, that my Mac read it. And this is like a Mac from the 90s. And this Mac oh, man. You know, converted it to an MP3 format in which I put on a zip disk. <laughs> and then I could put it on my P PC and then put it in the game. Oh my wow. god, this is like an early musician's fairy tale right here. <laughs> yeah. This really is. It's like an old-fashioned way, really. I learned music from recording a marimba to a floppy disk. <laughs> I really <laughs> have to awesome. ask, what program were you using to make these RPGs? Uh, as I said, it was RPG Maker XP. Okay. RPG called. Maker. So it's, now they're at VX or Ace or something or other, but yeah. yeah. 
That was back when Windows XP was the thing. Windows XP is still the thing. It is. It kind of is, yeah. It's still good. When you first started, when you were doing those RPGs, did you continue with that, or did you ever, like, have any kind of a big lull in your music making, or have you been pretty consistent since? It depends. I'd say when I picked up MLP in 2012, my music production was, like, a song a week. Same here. Because Toast Beard, that's why. Ah, we come back to Toast Beard. It always goes back to Toast Beard. Uh -huh, yeah, that's, okay, we came to that early. Yes. Okay, now hold on, because I remember you from Toast Beard. Do you? I remember you very, very vividly from that, because um, you were a name that I consistently saw in there, because I actually started out doing those. Yes. A long time ago, making songs that nobody will ever hear again <laughs> because of reasons. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about that. Like, like, how did how did you first find that? Did that start you into the whole uh, MLP music making thing? Well, okay. Let's see here. I started watching the show in early 2012. I was just kind of like, what if I sample this? I bet nobody has done that before. <laughs> 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 and then I, I don't know, in some related video, I ended up on Omniponies Return. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> Oh no. What have I stumbled upon here? Oh man. This just further reminds me how awful I am at music. Crap. Aww. And then so I went, I somehow tripped and fell over MLR, my little remix, at some point. And then I found Toast Beard. And then I just kept doing it and kept doing it. It's probably the reason I improved so quickly over that year. Mm. And are you still doing that? When I started doing Toast Beard, I was still going to my community college. So things were kind of not so stressful all the time, but like by the end of that year, I, I transferred to a university and it got pretty ugly. Um, so I didn't quite have time all the time. Okay. Was there a toast beer that sort of stood out as your favorite or was the one that helped you grow the most? No, not really. I mean, I think toast beer really helped me um, establish myself as a uh, diversifier with genres all the time because I was like, all right, this week, let's do some drum and bass. Then the next week, let's make something that sounds like a crappy 80s movie. <laughs> <laughs> that's, one of the, that's one of the great things about the Toast Beard competitions. For everybody who doesn't know what Toast Beard Comp is, it's just a music competition where every week they give you a prompt and you have a week to do a song for it. And so when the show is actively running, they'll do a whole lot of episode responses. So they'll basically say, here, take this week's episode and make a song about it. And then they give you a week. Is that still going on? Yeah. The episode responses are, yeah. But the one that was for off weeks or just during the breaks, the actual pony related ones aren't necessarily, uh, they're called ZIQs, the Zeeks. I love those. Those hit 99. So they ended because they only went from 00 to 99. So they started something else. And so now that's that right now. So they y 2 k basically. Yeah, kind of. And oh. but, I mean, they still could do a pony theme if they wanted to, but those were just not forcing it really anymore. So, but we'll still do episode responses. Those are still a thing. And we also have the whatever compos for those really weird events. And where do you find out about these? Like if somebody wanted to get involved in them? If you want to start contributing to a toast beard, you got to go to toastbeard.bronyradio.com. Um, I think. And really, there's no account or anything you gotta sign up for. It's just, you see what compos are going. It's kind of weird. It's kind of set up a little bit like a Chan board a little bit. Yeah, like you, you put a name, you upload a file, you put a password on it for deleting or changing stuff, and then just bam. I always did SoundCloud links just because I felt like that was easier. Yeah, and it gives you a prettier little embed thing, which is nice. Yeah, and there's always... If, you struggle with it you can always pop into the uh irc channel which is on the pony chat servers it's a br room called brony music i'm sure one of the channel operators including myself could help you so enough plugging for toast beard yeah <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah it sucks because it seems like the the whole like participation in toast spirit has declined a bit and i remember when those were uh I don't know if I was there for, like, the prime of the Toast Beards, because I don't think I was. I definitely wasn't. Back in the prime, it really produced some of the best music in this fandom. Yeah. Like, for a while, my favorite song was One Last Letter by Aviators and Bronified, and that came out from one of the themed competitions on End of the World in Equestria. Most of Aviators' extremely horse-famous songs come from Toast Beard. Yeah, and that's, that's something that a lot of people do, and I think we've mentioned this in the last episode. I mean, freaking Rainbow Factory, dude. Yeah, Rainbow 
Factory came from Toast Beard. Beyond Her Garden came from Toast Beard. It didn't even win that Toast Beard. That's the bad <laughs> Yeah, it didn't. But who won that one? I'm trying to remember. It got second. I remember It that. did get second. Rainbow's Blood by Interabang Kai won. Oh, right, yeah. I wasn't there for that compo, but I, I looked it up. It's... Mm -hmm. I looked that one up as well. It's a moment in history. Yeah, but it's like uh, Tombstone September mm -hmm. came from mm -hmm. that, I think. What yep. else? I'm forgetting a bunch now. Thought some of the wooden toaster stuff, yeah. Starlight, we've been listing wooden toaster this whole time. I'm sorry, I'm drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 funny, too, because we, we mentioned Wooden Toaster and some of the people that are joining the fandom now probably wouldn't even know exactly what we're referring to until we said Glaze. Yeah, doesn't even go by Wooden Toaster anymore. Yeah, that's true. Gosh, I can't even fathom that. Well, it works out better for him. It's just like AJ the Engineer. I miss AJ the Engineer. AJ the Engineer is something that used to be big back in those Toast Beard days. But now he's called Silen. Mm -hmm. It probably works out better for them because they want to be called that and now they are. So Yeah, but we, we mentioned with the Toast Beard that it helps you sort of develop a bunch of different genres. And one of the biggest things that I noticed is that you have a lot of genres. Yes. I don't even know if you could list the amount of genres that you have done stuff in. Yeah, I'd have a little trouble off the top of my head. Yeah, like, I'm looking at your SoundCloud, and I see French House, Video Game, Piano Something, Slam Jam, Dubstep, <laughs> Synth, uh, House, uh, Trip Hop, Neurofunk. And what you're seeing is a lot of stuff I've had to delete just because the song limit for people who don't pay for SoundCloud, like me. Ah, uh, I hate that so much. I have over a hundred Cartoon Horse-related songs. <laughs> so genres, tell us about your genres, or... The ones that are you are working on right now or, you know, ones that sort of stand out for the you. prominent ones. A lot of my diversity comes from just listening to a diversity of stuff. I mean, one second I could be listening to see me some, you know, straightforward Daft Punk kind of stuff. And then the next moment I'll be deep into some Venetian snares, crazy breakcore, alternate time signatures, terrifying things. Or the next second I could be listening to some really ambient post-rock or something like that. And my interests broaden every day i mean people show me stuff i come across other stuff and i like it i usually stay within the realm of electronic but really i'm open like lately i've been listening to a lot of uh, post rock that has some like black metal elements and i do like black metal i just don't listen to it straight all the time and, or like doom metal i kind of like some of that i just haven't exposed myself to a ton of it yet okay are there any genres that you think inspired you or something that you listen to a lot that motivated you the most when you were younger and first getting into music well straight up the one who inspired me to make electronic music at all is an artist called the flashbulb and the flashbulb he makes a variety of things as well, but usually a lot of people just kind of put a blanket over it and call it IDM, which is intelligent dance music, but that sounds douchey, so nobody in the industry actually says it. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you pointed it out. What about unintelligent dance music? UDM? Yeah. I think that's just classified as EDM. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Although that is that is like one of the rare times that I've heard somebody use IDM. We haven't we, have we heard about that since Silva? No. Okay, so that's interesting. A lot of people don't hear it and don't know what to call it. Mm -hmm. A lot of what the flashbulb makes stems from breakcore, but it's not directly as aggressive as most breakcore is. I guess you could say. One of the interesting things about you and all the genres that you work on is that you bridge the gap between the quote-unquote acoustic side of the Brony Musicians group and the electronic side. And I was wondering if you personally noticed any differences between the groups that you associate with in the acoustic side versus the electric side or any, any, any kind of differences in how people work. Actually, not necessarily. I mean, I have a lot of problems with collaborating with people. I haven't really gotten around to just doing many collaborations, so actually getting into the nitty-gritty of how people work is exactly something I'm not quite getting, but I kind of have an idea of how it works for the acoustic side. Now, the Ministry Mares was kind of like my first giant leap into that kind of thing. I really technically don't know how to play guitar, but I still do it anyway. Huh. <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> but I had a quarter for every time I hear that. <laughs> I just kind of, you know, put my fingers on the fretboard and strum and see if something good happens. That's how you play guitar, dude. 
Is it? There's no theory? Yeah. Like, I don't have to learn chords? <laughs> no, what? that's how Hendrix learned. Oh, okay. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, exactly. It's also how Michael Ackerfeld learned. Blows my mind. Okay. That's how I learned piano. Well, I did actually take piano lessons in which, you know, I started at age six. And probably from age six until 14, I cried my eyes out because I hated doing it. Really? <laughs> which is a very common thing for, you know, young... Because, you know, my parents were forcing me into it. I didn't... Ah. Uh... Yep, the common parents forcing you to play piano. I hate that. Play the piano. Do it. I wanted to go play computer games instead. But then when I turned 14, when I was starting to make that crappy RPG maker music, I'm like, what if I wrote music for games? Now this has a purpose. Yeah, suddenly it's so much more interesting, right? It's a, it's a lot more fun. I, I think it's a lot more fun to write your own songs than it is to try to learn other people's. That's just kind of my standpoint. Yes. Thank you. Some people like just learning songs, but that's just not me. Th- there is value in learning other people's songs in that you start to pick up things. Like one of the interesting pieces of advice I received, I don't know if it was on the show or if it was in some other interview that I was either present in or listening to, but it might even have been Silva. Yeah, so one of the things that I heard in that interview was when you cover other people's stuff, it really sort of broadens your own musical horizons and it teaches you things. And I noticed that, like I learned, you know, specific guitar licks or, you know, specific little decorations or however you want to talk about it, like in piano licks and stuff like that. And just little things, even like mixing, focusing on like the instrumentation that other people use and and just trying to emulate that for whatever reason has really kind of expanded my music as well. I don't usually directly try to learn a song and then try to emulate a style. Usually I'll listen to it over and over and over and over until I pick it apart piece by piece and see if I can come up with something similar. Usually I diverge with the melody and whatever, but usually I keep something like the drum beat the same, you know, something like that. But for instance, with the Ministry Mares, I sat down, actually the one we're going to listen to in a few minutes here, Pinkie Pie, I sat there and listened to the build-up from Godspeed You Black Emperor's East Hastings and the big crescendo from that song with the strings and the staccato and just the noisy build-up and then just the instant drop-off is really the inspiration for a lot of the structure of that song. Now we are going to take a little song break and listen to a song called Pinkie Pie. Yes, you are listening to Elements of Harmony on KPNY. No! Yes, no. Everything that worked, yes.
That was that was Pinkie Pie uh, from Seventh Element's recently released album, The Ministry Mares, concept album based off of Fallout Equestria. And there's a lot of tracks in there that are very similar to that, but Pinkie Pie was one of the ones that was really powerful early on in the album. I get the feeling that if it ha- this had like a music video done for it, it would be one of those super trippy music videos. Basically, yeah, it's it kind of reminds me of a I don't know like Fallout almost, or just like a creepy, ominous way, like like it's like it's on a screen, like an old television. Well, it, it is based off of Fallout Equestria. Yeah. Oh, it is. Oh, sweet. I was about to say. Yeah. Yes. I, I've said it like five times. <laughs> I did not know that. How many times have we been? Oh, this? dang. Dear- Which, by the way, I was going to ask Seventh Element, have you actually read all of Fallout Equestria? Yes, I have. I read it in about like mid late 2012. Have you read any of Project Horizons or any of the other spinoffs? Not yet, because I've been wanting to make this album since 2012, and I did not want to uh, infect this idea with the other ones yet. Not in a negative way. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Influence. Yeah, influence. That was probably the word I was looking for. But yeah, and the latter half of the song where Pinky is. Giving that letter to Twilight is straight up from the story. I cut some little parts out, which are the little bunches of static that you hear, but it's that part moved me a lot when I was reading the original story. It really impacted me. It made me want to cry. It was so sad. Okay, I'm going to try my very best not to deliver spoilers here. Spoiler warning! Yeah, but as you know, the story followed Equestria takes place 200 years after the lives of the main six. So you're pretty much going to assume they're all dead at this point. And right there was a clip of Pinkie Pie's last words, the final letter that she sent to Twilight before 
uh, she died, and it really. Oh. Yeah. That just got a whole lot more melancholy. Yeah. It's super heavy. I could hear that in the vocals. Uh huh. And just I have to I have to mention that for Pinkie Pie, those vocals were provided by somebody named Fo Snyder. Fox Cinder. Fox. Oh, sorry, Fox Cinder. It is spelled like Fo. I I don't know. But then again, the person I, I hear it pronouncing it could be wrong too. So it's pronounced F A U X like Fo. And then I know it's definitely Cinder spelled with an S. Cinder, right. Yeah, it's weird. Dyslexia, whatever. She did a really good job. Yeah. Yes, she did. That was very convincing. Yeah. Yeah, and when I listened to it originally, I, I like I've never read Fallout Equestria mm-hmm. and I have a thing of like refusing to read Fallout Equestria for reasons. But For reasons? For reasons. It's because I've been so into upheaval and everybody's like, oh, you should read Fallout Equestria. I'm like, no! <laughs> Wait, are they, are they, are they like, related or something? No, not at all. Not even. It's, it's just because, like, I want to be a douche. Um, it's you, just you being a stubborn... It's just me being a douche. Okay. Um, it's okay. Okay. But... So let me just ask a question for you, Forrest. If someone asked you to read it on your YouTube page, because I know you do those uh, readings for fanfics, you wouldn't do that? They have. They have, they've been asking for a while, and I've been like, no! Kind of is 2,000 pages long, so, you know. Well, then. I was about to say, Forrest, you'd never do anything else on that channel. That would just be your life from then on. That's true, yeah. And, like, I'm having enough problems with upheaval. But anyway, that's completely off topic. So, I've never read Fallout Equestria at all, but when I was listening to it, I could tell that Pinkie Pie was much older. Yeah. Just with the performance. Not, like, old, but, yeah. She's a lot older, and... She's kind of weary at this point. Yeah. She did sound very tired. Okay, spoiler alert, definitely. Spoiler alert! So plug your ears for a few seconds, kiddos. Because she was totally strung out on drugs at that point, And she made a total ass out of herself to all of her friends, and Twilight especially. And that was her apology to Twilight. And I don't know if you caught it, but she was talking about going somewhere to help get rid of her addiction problem. Because basically she took these drugs to enhance her pinky sense, which made her crazy sensitive and kind of psychic towards stuff. And she caught this dependency to it, and it really like made her act like even more abrasive than she usually is. And her ministry was one of the more, each one of the main six ran a specific wartime memory, or a ministry within the story of Fallout Equestria, and she ran one. That was all about keeping morale up, but instead spent a lot of time trying to find sympathizers to the opposite side of the war, the zebras. Used a lot of very unconventional and immoral ways of going about that. With this album, I can tell that there's been a lot of work and a lot of thought. And when I was listening to it, it, like I said in my intro for you, you are not afraid to break rules. And when I'm listening to this, I'm hearing... Specifically, things that caught me right off the bat, right at the beginning of the album with Memory Orbs, was just this deep voice over washy synths and this sort of dissonant guitar that's been overdriven on a digital amp, in a way, where it, it has that ugly sound that we hate as guitarists, but it works. I don't have pedals, so I just can't do anything with it. I, I wouldn't say hate. I wouldn't say hate was the right word for it. Yeah, I would say dislike. Use very sparingly and for the right things. That caught me off guard right off the beginning, and also the very obvious panning that I hear in there as well. But I, I just wanted to... That is a common post-rock trope. Lots of post-rock does the whole hard pan thing. Oh, okay. I don't hard pan necessarily, but yeah, a lot of it's... Uh... It's very involved in the stereo field, trying to place instruments in each ear. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's right, actually. It's kind of, like, if you listen to that song I talked about, East Hastings, you'll hear some of the strings in one ear, like, really distant, and it really kind of Mm -hmm. builds the atmosphere. That's kind of part of the point. One of the things that I wanted to read, which was right off your band camp, was something that... I don't know who wrote this. North Kozar, I believe, wrote a very, I guess, flattering, but also very descriptive review of your album that um, says, Provocative soundscapes of a torn time. The melodies are haunting yet inspiring, driven home by the overall post-rock style of the album and some absolutely gorgeous piano. A very apt description, I would say. Yeah. That's completely accurate in describing this album. 
And believe it or not, I know that guy. I've known that guy since MLR. I first started showing up there. So I was like, oh, hey, I remember that dude. Did you say you've been working on this since 2012? Not necessarily working on, thinking about. When did you actually start production? some point in 2013, school really kind of hindered me from truly spending a crap ton of time on it. But by the time I hit winter break uh, at the end of 2013, it was go time for the first half of the album. So majority of that was produced during that. And then... A few tracks in the middle came during the spring semester, but it's killing me <laughs> to try to work on those. So, like, right when school ended, I spent, like, the whole week writing, like, six songs. <laughs> oh, man. That's some good dedication, though. Well done. Yeah, very impressive. Yeah. Thank you. I spent over I spent over 100 hours on the album, which, for the length, I think that's a pretty short working time for most musicians, but that's just kind of how it works, I guess. I was about to say, how many songs is the album? Uh, 15, and most of them are about six minutes, except for the one that's 15. Yeah, it's like an hour and 40 minutes or something like that in total. Oh, wow. 100 hours for for 15, 15 six-minute songs? Wow. Well, 100 hours total for all hour and 40 minutes of the album. Wow. We're going to go ahead and switch gears a bit. You've been going to some conventions lately to perform. Is that correct? Uh, this is true. This year, I have gone to MLP MSP, which was the very first year it ran. And then I went to ProtCon this year, which was the third year it ran. All right, let's talk about MSP. How was the energy for your live performance? Oh, my Lord. That was probably the best crowd I've ever seen. It was a very, it was a very musician-friendly crowd, from what I heard. Absolutely. And I mean... The way it was organized within the convention, I think, is the best I've ever seen. Because for one thing, it's not run ridiculously late at night. Mm. So, like, the latest performance was Tombstone at 1 o'clock, and that's not bad. Yeah. People can stay up for that. I've seen conventions, you know, go till 3 or 5 in the morning, which is ridiculous. Nobody's going to come to that except the hardcore raver types. Yeah. And, I mean, a, a crowd of, you know, 5 and a crowd of 500 don't have much, I mean... You can say, you can argue that any crowd is a good crowd, but, you know, it's a little bit disheartening to see a very small amount of people in the room. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, so not only that, they didn't run any panels at the time of the shows, which really helped boost the turnout. Good. Which was, which was great. Mm -hmm. It was a first year con, and a lot of people, it was their first time going to a con. Apparently... Lots, lots of them were Minnesota natives, and lots of them had never been to a convention before, and this was their first chance. Wow. I've been hearing a lot of stuff at MSP, like, people did stuff way right. Yes. Is what I'm hearing. Yes. Yeah, I heard this one became a very successful convention, and it's not to mention there was a lot of new people, like, they've never been to a convention, period. That's kind of a, with a lot of, like, smaller conventions. Like, I've been to Clasdale Congress for the first time, first year. That was mostly a lot of first people. Catalog Gardens, even when its first year, had a lot of people who'd never been to conventions. Midwestria, Midwest Brony Fest, Fiesta, Equestria. All the smaller conventions, they usually are most, it seems like almost mostly, people who had never gone to conventions before. Yeah, I just find that actually really common in the pony fandom in general, because, you know, being staff on BronyCon, we get a lot of people telling us this is their first convention they've been to. It isn't the majority of people that show up, but there's a lot, and it really surprises me. Yeah, even people on staff who have never been to conventions before. Maybe it's just because the fandom's so much more accessible than, say, the anime fandom or the furry fandom or anything like that. The thing about those two fandoms is they have this diverse bunch of different things that kind of produce a weak link between them, but we have this very strong link between us where we like this one specific thing. Yeah. It kind of reminds me, at the very first BronyCon I went to back in 2012, I remember we were standing in line for Saturday to go into the vendor hall, or the, I guess it was the everything hall. I remember there was this guy I was talking to, and he, he said he'd been going to fantasy conventions since the 70s, and he told me that he had never been to a convention like this before, because a lot of conventions, you know, obviously there's multiple shows, movies, whatever, there's there's all these different, you know, groups that are all convening together. But I mean, with us, it's it's really it's really different. Like some of the biggest clashes you might ever see at a pony convention is like who is best pony. <laughs> yeah. 
that might be the biggest spat you'll have. But I mean, anime and Star Wars and Star Trek and all the other stuff conventions. Oh my gosh. The year can be a lot of drama and a lot of clashes and just like. Oh yeah. But we have all this camaraderie between us, you know. Love and tolerate. When I was just walking around BronyCon, you know, people waiting in line, you know. Fist bump all the people in line, you know, just like whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's it's a lot. It's Yeah, it's a lot of how the Bronies like just think and have that attitude towards life that just says be nice to people. It makes for really great public events. It's great. Mm-hmm. For sure. It's totally opposite of what Tumblr thinks of us, but we are really just a friendly bunch of nerds. And amazing charity work, too. <laughs> yes, yes. I was floored at MLP MSP when I, I found out how much they made in that charity. Yeah? yeah. Yes. How much did they do? I think they did like a 8.4K. Wow. Wow. That's, wow. That's, pretty, that's pretty nice. Yeah. I mean, actually, one of the best... I was actually there for like the tail end of this thing because I wanted to go to closing ceremonies, but the charity auction was running over. But uh, a, jeweler, a jewel maker... Uh, Oh, do you mean Silver Slinger? Chaotic Harmony? Or Silver S- Silver Slinger, yeah. Yeah, he's not called Chaotic anymore. Yeah, it's Silver Slinger. He had, he had this, uh, you know, Pinkie Pie wrapper medallion and a rarity brooch. And a dude got it for like 2500 It was intense. Wow. I was like, whoa. Jeez. Uh, I remember at Midwest Bernie Fest, one of uh, my convention, that we, um, we made like $3,600. And there was probably only like... 40 people in the room. I was honestly surprised. It was re- a lot of help from Peter New, freaking running around in circles and sweating on plushies to hopefully get him to sell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one other thing I wanted to mention about um, MLP MSP and was just I kind of had this whole new uh, performance set up. Like I was, I wasn't just pressing play anymore. I was, you know, doing obnoxious tape stops to everything and all that. <laughs> and so with that, I had a new bunch of music to go with it um and i made this uh, trap song it was the first time i ever made a trap song it's called it's a rock and I shamelessly sampled daft punk for this song <laughs> and i was just i had no idea how the crowd was going to react because trap as you may know is a genre like that comes from hip-hop it's been around for like 10 years and now is kind of uh, started bleeding over into electronic and it's kind of like just almost like rap music without the lyrics, but with goofy electronic in- instrumentation and stuff. But yeah, and I had no idea what, how the crowd was going to react, but man, they went crazy. And Tetsuo, he just he ran up to me while I was on stage. He's like, "Dude, turn it up, turn it up." <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's okay. And just the bass in the room was just amazing. Even from where I was standing, it was just great. All righty then. Speaking of, it's a rock. Let's listen to it right now. Seventh Element, it's a rock. Here on Elements of Harmony on Everfree Network. It's a rock, 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 rock. It's a rock, 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 rock. It's a rock, 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 rock. It's a rock, 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 rock. It's a rock, 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 rock. It's a rock, 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 rock. It's a rock, 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 rock. It's a rock, 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 rock. It's a rock, 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 rock. It's a rock, 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 rock.
flash. Yeah, this is a certified hood classic. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes. Yeah. This was acceptable music. I love songs with really good bass because it feels like massaging on my ears with the vibrations. Oh, yes. And at MLP MSP, this vibrated the entire crowd. <laughs> oh, I imagine. It was great. Mod Pie would change expression to this music. It's very much a club song. Like mm. I, this is a song that I would love to hear in a club. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you could probably hear it at a normal, like, hip-hop playing club. <laughs> like, you, and they probably wouldn't even know the difference. They would not know any cartoon horse-related things. Yeah. Things. I know. That's what I love a lot sometimes about Bernie music, is sometimes you'll be listening to this and you're like, huh. This is, this is. I think it's only the pic by a picture that I can tell this is pony music. Yeah, I I remember in early in my pony music career that like people would be all like, "Wow, I wouldn't have known this was pony otherwise." Like, and actually, some some people I got comments from you know like really early on they're all like, "Man, if you remove the pony from this, you'd probably get really popular." And I'm like. <laughs> Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of been a thing with the electronic music in the fandom, right? And I think that's why Archie removed all of his stuff. Well, I think he had more copyright reasons, and just because he joined a record label, and I mean, that has more to do with it than anything. But yeah, speaking of you know electronic music, not so electronic music, all the music that you do, let's discuss the elements of genre. All right. Uh, and. I have no idea where to begin with this. I have a beginning point. Here we go. Sometimes I hear a lot of people complain that are have eclectic music tastes. Like, music is just music. Why classify it by genre? Well, you cl listen to a lot of music, as we've heard tonight. Write a lot of music. Why classify by genre? Well, yep. I've gotten this question before. And honestly, I think that music is nothing but organized noise. If you really want to put it that way, that's fine. But I think, you know, if you did the same thing with paintings, you know, then what would be the point of calling something Renaissance or Expressionistic or, you know, Experimental? What's the point of calling different canvases different things? What's the difference between, you know, oil and acrylic? I mean... Yeah, it's all art, right? So it's all art. Exactly. And, you know, we all have our preferences with what, what elements we like in music. And genres are just a bunch of elements combined into one similar convention. I mean, in the least technical possible terms, I guess. That's actually a fantastic way of putting that. Well, and also along that point, it is, but you also said, what's the point? It was almost answering a question with a question, but the point is, it allows us to classify these things and talk about them on a level of understanding. So, you know, when I'm saying, I just heard an awesome song the other day, instead of saying it was music... That's all I know. You can say, well, you know, break it down. Yeah, exactly. And I know electronic music gets a really bad rap for subgenres. <laughs> and I know rock and metal does, but electronic subgenres, you know, they divide like cells, man. They just kind of pop up and split constantly and take elements from this, that, this, that. And that's just because electronic music is a very modular thing. Right. It's a lot more accepted that anything goes, kind of. Well, every genre is kind of different, but we all experience the same thing, like kind of like the hate, I would say. 
like back in like the 60s when rock started out like nobody really liked it except like the younger generation and then it just moved on to the next genre after another <gasps> rock is the genre of the devil and by the by the late set no because no because what during like the 40s and 50s it was mostly just like blues jazz classical and swing and just and then just, like during the late 50s like rock started to break in you're forgetting disco hello <laughs> disco was 70s, so I didn't move them. Yeah, disco was 70s. And by the late 70s, early 80s, people kept saying, disco sucks, rock music is the only way to go. Well, disco didn't last that long. I it... like disco. I love disco too. So one thing that we need to touch on here is how genres interact, because Snow brought up the fact that young people in the uh, the 50s were getting into the, the rock scene, and the older people just didn't understand this noise. But they didn't realize that rock has roots in blues. Yes, it does. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a combination of, like, blues and jazz. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Whenever we come up with new tools to create music, it will always take what previously came before, and then we'll match it. It's kind of just a combination thing. It's a lot like genetics, except there are multiple parents from different places it it really reminds me of modern day examples so say all the kids are listening to skrillex so i i love skrillex and like there's some tracks that he does that i would classify almost as noise that would be dubstep <laughs> where it really is just a bunch of different electronic sounds all just put together to sort of kind of keep a beat and just sort of tell i guess almost a musical story just through different textures and sounds. Yes. Skrillex gets a bad rap for being all loud and stuff, but when it all comes down to it, he's very detailed with the soundscapes that he makes. If you listen to like little clips of Skrillex songs, he's put a very uh, intricate amount of detail in, in between each beat. I mean, and he makes it breathe, and it's, got, it's very snappy and very loud, of course. That's just kind of the style. <laughs> but I mean... A lot of people don't realize that before Skrillex was around, dubstep had been around for like 10 years as kind of like a dub offshoot, like a reggae-ish. Uh, and then... Yeah, Skrillex did not create dubstep. No, he didn't. You're right. Doesn't Skrillex say he's not dubstep? I don't know if Skrillex has ever explicitly said that, but a lot of people call it bro-step, which is supposed to be an insult. <laughs> I prefer American dubstep is probably like more like it, even though it didn't exactly start with Skrillex and stuff. Well, yeah, he didn't really create it. I say he took it to a new turn, I would say. He changed it. There's definitely a big difference between what Skrillex does and a lot of the dubstep that you hear. Yeah. And I think that part of his negative rap is a lot of the generic dubstep that's out there, and people see Skrillex as this headliner in the dubstep genre, so they pin all their complaints of dubstep onto Skrillex. Yeah, as if it's his fault. And honestly, if you listen to his first EP, like barely any of it's like that. A lot of it's kind of like really grimy electro house, really. But honestly, when people call any music noise, I invite them to listen to some harsh noise or power electronics. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't very much that goes around the fandom, but if any if you have heard of Super Saw Hoover, you know yep. exactly what yeah. I'm talking yep. about. Yep. Yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> One of the things that I wanted to mention in the same vein of genres overlapping is we had a conversation before the show where me and Snow were talking about one of the songs that I referenced in uh, the intro way back an hour ago. We did? Yeah. One of the songs in the intro was Please Don't Jump. Yes. Uh... <laughs> Which is classified as French House. Yes. And when I listen to it, I just hear disco. <laughs> I hear disco as well. I have it's like a '70s style to it. I don't know what you guys are talking about. So there's French house and there's disco house. They're very, very similar. A disco house kind of goes to achieve the straight up kind of disco styling, except with more you know electronic sounds integrated with it, rather than having a full band orchestra or whatever. Whereas French house is a lot like viewing disco through a, a kaleidoscope of some kind. You know, you listen to Daft Punk, you listen to Breakbot or any other French house artist that you can think of. Maybe even Sim Gretna if you're crazy enough. French house is also called filter funk, 
uh, where a lot of it's where people are messing with filters and effects and goofiness. There's a lot of funk elements in it too. That's one of the things I noticed with it is yeah, it's really disco, but it has it has those funk elements, especially with the, the the sax sections and stuff like that. It's not the sax sections aren't just that that really quick impacting disco stuff where it would just be like a um blah blah blah. You know what I'm talking about. Um, just the quick staccato things. It's yeah, it has that good. It has that really good funk into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a groove. Yeah, French house is all about like sampling. Disco house does take samples sometimes, but sometimes they do pure instrumentation, whatever. But French house is all about sample manipulation. And if you listen to Daft Punk, they they take samples from everywhere. Yeah, kudos to sampling Fenning in that song, by the way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I had to. I was just all like, you know, people keep making this joke, and now I gotta make a song about it. <laughs> and you know, when Fenning found out, he's he, he thought it was great. <laughs> it is just kind of funny because it just all started from that. As Fenning put it, it's like the official soundtrack of BronyCon 2013. Yeah, you can't expect Bronies to make a 1.6 magnitude earthquake in Baltimore and then not have a song written about it. Pretty much. It's kind of insane how we create, like, the world's natural disasters in BronyCon. We need to get an official an official, official seismograph or something and actually re- record specifically for the convention. <laughs> record the tectonic activity of BronyCon? Well, that's how we figured it out last year was because of a seismograph. So my question is, is it going to be a 1.8 or a 2.0 this year? No. We're going to try to ha- we're going to try to have it less than that because we don't want the structural integrity of the building to be at stake. Well, it's happening in the basement this year, so we're we're it's, we're not going to have that uh, that sympathetic vibration from the building, like like with that bridge. If you ever saw saw that old uh, footage of the bridge waving, no, I felt the vibration beneath my feet. I was in the game room and I felt I was like, "What's this vibration against my feet?" And I'm like, "I can feel it. It's so strong." Like, DJ Midley, I think, was shooting a video, and, like, he was standing completely still, and you can just see the video, like, going up and down, like, the floor was oscillating. So I figured out by roughly how many people are estimated to have been at the concert by what I'm guessing at least is a good idea of the average weight of each person, equaled out to... The way if everybody jumped at the same time, it would have been as if the Statue of Liberty was dancing on the floor. (laughs) (laughs) But there, there had to only there were definitely like less than like a sixteenth of people who went to the concert. Like of of all the eight thousand attendees, there couldn't have been like any more than a sixteenth because that room was not chock full of people. No, it wasn't that really full. It like it was very big and spacious. Like you can actually dance. I I, I like to imagine the Statue of Liberty dancing in Baltimore Convention Center. I was about to say I was about to flay you for bringing math in here again, and I'm glad I didn't because that was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's divert the subject then. A gigantic Statue of Liberty twerking. In no. Oh yeah. No. Yeah. Oh. We need this to happen. No. <laughs> And on that bombshell... Yes. All right, I think it's time to end this show. Thank you very much for coming on tonight, Seventh Element. Thank you for having me, guys. I really enjoyed this this thing you have here. It's a good thing. On that bombshell, we're ending the show. Sweet dreams, everybody. We would like to thank our guest, Seventh Element, for coming on tonight. And this week, we have some wonderful programs coming up on Everfree Network. On Wednesdays, we have KPNY at 7, Into the Spotlight at 8 p.m. And then on Thursdays, we have Sketchy Sounds Live Songcast at 3 p.m. And Equestria Unlimited at 7 p.m. All of these times are in Central. Until next time, this is... Forest Rain. Swift Storm. Zeta Prime. Snowblitz. And Starlight Ironhoof. Good night and good luck.